one key pillar in advocacy efforts. So when you look at that value chain, you see that there's research, there's engagement, there's comms, and then there's impact. And then under comms, you have, you know, you have strategic side of comms, you have the branding side of comms, then you have the storytelling part of comms. So it's a lot of moving pieces that come together to like make one huge sense. And so when I talk to people, I tell them that number one, storytelling is effective. It's a tool that is effective, but then it has, it needs every other element to be able to like sort of thrive and achieve what you want it to achieve, right? So setting the scene that, you know, within the context of advocacy and the logical flow of the way advocacy goes, it is that there's your research. And then from research, you have some level of data that you want to use to engage your stakeholders, for example. And then that data, you take it and translate it into engagement objectives. And then from your research and engagement objectives, you can bring those together to sort of, from, okay, this, are the, this is the research that we have available and these are the key stakeholders during our engagement process. What do they want to know? What do they want to hear? Uh, and how can we begin to frame those messaging, tailoring it to what they want to know? And of course, the impact side of things, which is um, also like, it has to do with um, M and E. Ca can you see my slides? Are they moving? Um, I'm on the next slide now. I just want to be no. sure that... Still no, on the no it's still on the data, the um, cover mm -hmm. page, I think. Yes. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Thank you very much. So just. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Just hold on. Um, stop sharing this one. I think I shared the wrong window. So let me share again. And then this is the window that I want to share. Okay. How about now? Is it moving? It's still uploading. Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, it's moving okay. now. Right. Key objectives. This was what I was showing you guys, setting the scene. So I'm sorry, I didn't know. Okay, like... yeah. All right, yeah. So uh, yeah, I already read out the objectives. Then I was saying that we are setting the scene and I already talked about the value chain of saying that storytelling does not um does not work in itself. It needs other elements of advocacy to sort of try. And I spoke about research, engagement, comms, and impact. So I'm going to like try to really move uh uh, very quickly with the slides. So um, on, now understanding that this is the context or this is the framework that it, it's a very it's a very simple framework because this is not like the old framework, obviously. I'm just trying to sort of help you paint a picture to see how things flow when it comes to advocating or when it comes to like uh, spotlighting development issues, for example, and how, you know, you begin to think of all the, the internal value chain that helps you tell a good story, right? And then let's talk about the key concepts. I think that we don't need to talk about storytelling again because we already spoke about that in the general, uh, uh, during the general session. Uh, but again, to recap, storytelling just basically simply means you're using narrative to influence, to educate, to mobilize, and to inspire individuals, stakeholders, communities towards achieving certain goals or certain objectives. It means that you want to say a particular action and then you are trying to use storytelling to sort of stir up conversations and actions towards you know, that goal or action. And then of course, data, which is the crux of this particular breakout section, uh, session. Uh, uh, what is data? I define data as uh, information collected and analyzed to understand a specific issue, audience or impact. Now, it can be in the form of uh, measurement, statistics or evidence that can be used as a basis for reasoning, argument, discourses, or advocacy. Um, and you know, one of the things that I wanted to say during the general session is that one of the things that also gives your story authenticity and credibility and makes it genuine is that it is backed by data, it is backed by information. Now I tell people that you are not Instablog Niger, you are not Yaba Left Online. I mean, it's a business model. I don't have anything against those guys. I'm just saying that if you want to tell stories that you know that empower stories that you know would um, that would prompt people to take action, it, you have to come correct with data. You have to come correct with research, uh, and you just it, you are not trying to be uh, sensational. You are not trying to like just post stuff without you know having uh uh, uh what's it called now having data backing it up, for example. So, and that's why data is very, very crucial in telling our story. That's one perspective. The other perspective is also that most of the work that we do within a different organization, there's some level of research that goes into it, but then there's a kind of um, gap in how comes professional organizations translate data into stories. For example, and that's one of the things that we also will learn during uh, during this session. That number one, data is important because it helps you tell credible stories and authentic stories. It helps. It gives. Um, it gives. It, it makes your story robust and it gives credibility to it. And secondly, 
when there is data, you have to also find a way to find the story in your data so that it makes sense to your audience. And of course, metrics. There's not telling a story without looking at the fact that, okay, this story I'm telling, is it, do you want to just tell a story for telling story's sake? Or there's something you want to achieve? And how do you understand or how do you know if you're achieving that particular goal or objective? It is through your metrics. Now, the metrics here are not your advocacy metrics. They are your storytelling metrics. The metrics for advocacy are different. These are storytelling metrics. And of course, impact, how do you measure your impact? How do you know that, you know, how do you measure the change or the effects that is, you know, that your storytelling efforts are creating? How do you measure increased awareness? How do you measure improved engagement? How do you measure, measure policy change? And of course, your narrative. Narrative is basically an account of events, experiences, or issues that convey meaning and context, emphasis on context. So um, having de defined those um, key con uh those key uh, uh concepts i would go into uh why do we tell stories the reason i'm also doing this is because i want us to all like have like a general understanding of you know the key the key foundation that forms telling effective story uh before we move into the data part so we already said it uh, why do we tell stories to raise awareness to educate to empower to shape public opinion and perspectives. We also tell stories to challenge stereotypes. Story can, stories can challenge and change negative stereotypes and misconceptions, for example, about communities, about regions, about issues. It also promotes a more accurate and positive understanding of a particular context. Stories can help you break development issues into very simple, relatable contexts using real life people, real life scenarios, and real life experiences. And of course, storytelling is also for advocacy and influence. Uh, it is that you are telling, you want to persuade your donors, you want to persuade the government, you want to persuade policymakers that this development initiative or this development action is going to be beneficial to a particular, you know, a particular uh, group of audience. And then you try to weave that story in a way that they are going to see reason with your advocacy. And lastly, of course, to mobilize resources uh, and uh, mobilize action, mobilize people to take action. Um, and of course, uh, what is data-driven storytelling? I already touched on it that data-driven storytelling is just a process of using data and analytics to inform, create, and narrate stories that create and convey insights, trends, and pattern. Uh, um, data, having data or research ensures that your narratives are grounded in reality, credible, and they are tailored to resonate with the intended audience, right? And by data, I don't want you to look at one, two, three, like figures or graphs of course, that's also part of data, but I also want you to look at the qualitative aspects of data, like the interviews, the participatory research, the focus group conversations that you have with people just to understand their context better or to understand how a particular issue, you know, affects them. Now, when you have, when this is integrated into your storytelling, it gives, there's a way it helps you ground your narratives in reality. It helps you have that confidence to say that, okay, this, this advocacy or this, this story we are telling, it's not just that we just woke up one day and they wanted to, you know, stoke a fire or something. It's because there are real people facing this problem and then we want to, this is their account of the problem and we are bringing this account to you so that you can do something about it, basically. And of course, I said that data also empowers storytellers to address complex issues with accuracy and sensitivity so that your stories can resonate with, you know, uh, relevant stakeholder groups. We already spoke about that. And again, data also serves as that foundation upon which your stories are built and it provides the factual basis, depth and authenticity that reinforce the problem and provides a basis for action. I, I think this is quite straightforward. I won't dwell too much on it because we have uh, some places that would really uh, uh, spend a lot of time on. And of course, data quality dimensions, what defines a good data? Number one, now, when you, when you think about data, this class is that you are using data to inform your storytelling, right? It, is, it doesn't mean that you are the person gathering the data or it, it doesn't mean that you are the researcher. I showed you the value chain initially that there's a value chain within advocacy and then there's a research aspect of it. Most organizations would definitely like have the research team that does the whole book of research and then they have the key data. And then you as a comms person take that data and say that, okay, what are the insights that I can get from the data? So I'm just saying that when I talk about data here, don't think about it as so, so where do I want to go and get my data from? It's just for you to look at the ecosystem within which you work and look at, okay, who can give me the data where, or who does the research? And if it is you also, of course, you'll be able to understand what I'm talking about. 
when it comes to uh, um, having a good data to tell your story. So data quality dimensions of uh, number one, it has to be accurate. It has to be accurate. It has to capture actual real world scenarios and your data has to be, it has to be, it has the way it's collected. It has to be that it is collected from the source. It is that it's not that you just woke up and said, okay, maybe if poverty is 70%, then unemployment should be 30%. It is that there's a credible source where you are getting that data from and then you can trust that source. Then complete completeness, data should also deliver the required value value. So you have you also have that responsibility to look at the data that you have and say that okay, this data is it telling me the is it giving me the value that I want? Is it going to help me telling my to tell my stories effectively or do I need to get more data? We're going to get that to that like using the example for that. And of course, consistency. There must be uniformity of data and there must not be conflict. For example, if your data is saying that in this particular community, uh, the consumption pattern is sort of, um, uh, what's it called now, is influenced by uh, how much people earn, for example, and then you've been able to like maybe get a secondary data to say that, oh, farmers in this community earn between 10,000 and 20,000. And then you go to the community to sort of get your own perspective of that particular figure, that data, that, that numeric data that you have. And then from them, you are hearing that, oh, no, it's not 10,000 to 20,000. It's actually 2,000 to 3,000. There's like some sort of irregularity. And it's not. It's fun. So one of the things that you need to also uh, uh, take note of when you want to tell your stories with data is that whatever data you have collected has to be consistent. You know, it has to be uniform and it must not be conflicted. And of course, it has, to, it has to be valid. Sorry. Can you help us meet your mic, please? Okay, I think I can meet you from here. Uh, thank you. All right, and uh, timeliness data is available when required. You know, I tell people one of the things that key things that stakeholders or sort of take note of or pay attention to is when you have when you collect your data, and that's why you know when you have data, if if you if you collect a data today and then you wait for like say two months, you would. Realize that after two months, that data might have changed. And that's why having data means that you're also taking action almost immediately. Or when you're ready to take action, you go back to that data and then you probably begin to say that, okay, this was the information we had and that when we took this data, what has changed? Uh, so that when you are telling your stories, you are not caught between the middle of, oh, okay, oh, and stakeholders are telling you that this data you collected is actually not true. It is not that it is not true, it is that it is outdated or it is no longer relevant for the story that you are trying to tell. So when you have data that you want to use to tell stories, it must be timely and it must be accurate. Another way you can flip it is that when you are telling your story and you are giving your narrative and you see that the data is quite maybe like two months ago, it's the onus is on you as the person communicating or telling you to say, as at the time we collected this data, which was 26th of February 19, uh, 2023, this was what the data said. Of course, it might have changed today, but as at the time we collected it, this was what we had. So it's the onus is on you to be able to like sort of interrogate that data and say that is it is it is it timely? If it is timely, if it is not timely, uh, uh, find a way to frame your messaging to reflect the timeliness or the 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 accuracy of that data. And of course, let's get to the meat of the conversation. I said all of that to sort of set the scene for the conversation. Now, going into finding the story in your data, we've been able to establish that data is very crucial in telling stories. It is that thing that gives your story genuine genuinity. It is it makes it authentic and then it makes it relatable. And again, I said that when it comes to data, don't think of data as just the numbers. Also think about it qualitatively as the people you talk to, as the communities you visit, as the as the stakeholders you interrogate, people who can give evidence, oral evidence about a particular situation or a particular issue. Now, when it now comes to finding the story in your data, uh, um, um, if you look at this picture on the screen, it sort of gives you like a bit of context that there's baking pan, there's flour, there's butter, and then there's soda. But the thing is that this is like, these are all like raw data. This is information right here staring at you. And then you're looking at it and you're debating, okay, what do I want to do with this information? Do I want to bake a cake? Because obviously those are the ingredients that you use to bake a cake. Or do I want to make um, a roll? Because these are the same ingredients that you used to make a roll. Or do I want to bake a pie? These are the same ingredients that you used to bake a pie. And now, what determines what you eventually go for is the context of what you're trying to say. For example, if there's a birthday, if you have a birthday, you're not 
the, the first thing that comes to your mind is a cake, not, you know, not a, a, a meat roll or, or, or anything like that. Or say, for example, you are outside or maybe you want to host your friends. The first thing that comes to your mind is not to bake a cake and decorate it. The first thing is, like, okay, let's make some pies so that my friends can eat. So I'm just trying to use the same context to say that, yes, you might have data, but then data can tell you different stories. You are the one that needs to find the story that is in your data. And how do you find the story in your data? It is your objective that defines the story that you tell. Objective in that, is it birthday I want to do? If it is birthday, then I need to bake a cake. If it is that I want to host my friends, then I, I need to make a pie. All right, so let's let's have like some real, um, uh, what's it called now? Some, some, some real context for finding a story in your data. Now, let's take the first, this was one of the infographics that we designed when I was in budget. And then there was an allegation um, against the accountant, accountant general of the federation, then that he stole uh, 80 billion naira. He looted 80 billion naira. And then the story was going up and down, like, oh, um, this guy looted and all of that. But what we said was that, okay, people need to understand the gravity of what this guy just did. That it's not just that he stole 80 billion naira. It is that that 80 billion naira is more than the combined capital fund spent on education, humanitarian affairs, and police affairs in 2020. Those are three key sectors that need investment in Nigeria. And then you are saying that one person actually stole funds that is enough to fund, or that is more than what was allocated to these three sectors in one fiscal year. Now, that sort of gives you more context to the data. Now, the data is that this guy stole 80 billion naira. But the story now is that we need to make you understand the effect of this 80 billion era on people or on real life context. And then we created that context for it. Now, you can see the difference between, okay, you have the information, you have the data, and then you are finding the story because you want people to be able to relate with it so that they can tune up their, 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 their uh, what's it called now, their pressure on the government, for example, or the pressure on EFCC so that they can probe this guy further and say that this is something that cannot be, uh, that cannot be overlooked. Um, am I still, are we still together, please? Because I know I can't hear anybody. You can just type in this. Okay. We are together, 100%. Can I hear you? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. So that's that's one example, uh, and and that's what I that's one of the things that I want us to like think about in this session. That when you think about data, the first thing that comes to your mind is that how do I bring this data to life? How do I make it relatable? How do I make it you know more robust? How do I make people you know understand what this data is saying within the context of development? Let's take another one on this issue of looting and embezzlement. This is another context context by David Cameron said if the amount of money stolen from Nigeria in the last 30 years was stolen from the UK, the UK would cease to exist. Now, this gives you like some, and then in your mind, you know that when you're talking about this kind of money, you're not talking about 30 billion naira, you're not talking about, you know, 50 billion naira, you're talking about millions of dollars. I mean, you, we all heard about Yahya Bilo and Amot, I think $800 million or something that he stole and then paid for his children's school fees. And that's just for his children's school fees. I'm sure that there are like more that they've not even unpacked or uncovered. So when you think about the amount of money, what kind of money can you steal from Nigeria that would make UK cease to exist? It's the same as stolen from the UK. It shows you the kind of, the level of corruption, the level of embezzlement and the level of misappropriation of money going on in Nigeria today. Look at this one again. The former governor of Niger Delta State has, ordered, has been ordered to pay over 100 million pounds and his solicitor over... 28 million. I mean, you begin to think about, okay, how does 100 million pounds can effectively fund healthcare in Nigeria, can effectively, you know, primary healthcare, you know, different 36 states of Nigeria, or you think about education, you think about different things that need investments in Nigeria, and you think that one, and you think about the fact that one person stole 100 million pounds from a particular economy. And then we have sectors like education health that are rotting because there's no enough investment in them. So these are ways to sort of look at your data and try to like bring it into context that if you're asking for this, it is because, you know, it is because this is the context, it's because this is what it leads to. Um, let's see some other scenarios. Now, look at Nigeria's income inequality outlook for 2020. It says that the full population is about um, uh, average income. We have, 
Nigeria's population is over 200 million. That's you know understandable. And then full population, we are saying that the average income uh, uh, purchasing power parity for say the, the bottom 50 in Nigeria currently earn 587,000, average of 587,000 Naira monthly. The middle people that, that earn like the middle class, they earn about 3.38 million per annum. And then the top 10% earn about 8 million and the top 1% earn about 37 million. Now, what's the top 1%? The top 1% is about 2 million people. So you're saying that 2 million people out of 200 million people actually earn, actually earn 37 million per annum. About 3.7 million is roughly. Now, this is data and this is like, you know, if somebody that is not a comms person or somebody that is just maybe... um. Uh, uh, a citizen looks at it, they can't really make sense of, okay, what does it really mean that the top 1% earns 37 or top 10% earn 8 million per, per, per annum? Now look at what Taiwo Edele has to say about it. He says that if you earn 3.5 million per annum or more, you are in the top 1% of Nigeria's population. Now, in our added an addendum, said, it is not because you are so rich, it is because others are so poor as the vast majority of Nigerians live in extreme poverty. And that helps you make sense of that data that, oh, yes. If you look at top 10, top from top 10 to bottom 50, you see that represent about 119 million. So we are saying that about 119 million people in Nigeria actually earn below 3 million naira per year. No, that's ridiculous because you see that the gap now, another story it tells you is that the gap between the lower class and the high class is very, very wide. That it's going to take a lot of years for that for that gap to be closed if the government does not do something. It also tells you that when you say that middle, the middle class, the middle class, what makes the middle class? The, look at the difference between the middle class and the top 1%. That's about, middle class is about 3.38 million per annum and then top 1% is about 37.5 million. Look at that gap in a... And when you look at a same country like the UK, you see that this is not, the gap is not this wide. Of course, every economy has the lower class, the middle class and the higher class. But when we talk about equity, it is that when you look at the gaps and the opportunities that are available, it's, it's, it levels the playground, playground in such a way that it, the difference is not much. And, and it's, not, it's not very evident that these people are doing so poorly. So this suggests something. Number one, people are poor. Number two, people are not earning enough. Number three, there are no opportunities in Nigeria. Now, those are now look at crafting some of those narratives and some of those insights from just this data. Whereas if you put this data out and you say that, oh, Nigeria's income inequality outlook for 2022 is out, and then let's look at it, and then you just post it there. People are wondering, okay, what does this mean? Or how can we translate this into story? Or what, what exactly is interesting about this data? And that's our responsibility as comes with it, is that you look at data like this and you're like, okay, what kind of story uh, uh, can we tell from this kind of data? So moving on, um, that's just to sort of help us set the scene and set the pace that, you know, uh, um, 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 there's data and then there's a way to look at data such that it begins to bring our stories to life. That's number one. And then number two, it is that if you want to tell more compelling stories, then you need to be able to bring in data and research into your stories to give it more life and to give it more context. Um, I'll tell you another story quickly before I go to the next slide. It is that, you know, uh, there was... Um, a research that we did in my organization, that research sort of talks about big corporations, uh, influential companies in the food and agricultural sector, for example, going into local communities to source water uh, that, let me say, for example, Coca-Cola. Go, they go into some of these communities and then they source for water, and source for other stuff that they use for, you know, for their products. And then one of the questions we're asking them is that when you guys source for this water, or for some of these resources, how do you practice regenerative um, agriculture in that, you know, you, you practice a system whereby there's a way to replenish what has been lost by your exploration. And then most of them don't have, a, don't have an answer. The answer they would have for you is that, oh, we have CSR that sort of, you know, creates a bottle in this community, for example. But the real, the real essence is that, you know, when you when you take resources from these communities it, 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 and you don't replenish it, it, it only means one thing for them. It is that when the time comes for them to use some of these resources for their own well-being, for example, use water to bathe or use water to cook, it means that they are going to have to go through an extra pressure to be able to get water because you who has influence over that community has finished using the, all the water or you've, you know, reduced it to 
very, very minimum capacity. Now, what is data? The data is that big corporations are, you know, they are not practicing, practicing regenerative, regenerative agriculture. They are not replenishing the resources that they use from local communities. And the story there is that it's not just that this is what it means for people living in that community. This is what it means for their quality of life. This is what it means for their well-being. So when, when, when you look at data like that, you try to like bring it into that context so that, you know, Whoever you're talking to, whatever advocacy you are doing, can have more life and more uh, a context to it. Uh, so framework for crafting compelling story. I'm sorry I'm moving so fast. It's because I know that we don't have a lot of time. Um, framework for craft, crafting compelling story. Number one, define your objective. You know, we already spoke about this. Like you have to clearly identify the goal of your story. What do you want to achieve? Who do you want to inform? Who do you want to persuade? Who do you want to inspire? And who do you want to motivate? You have to define your objective. Understand who your audience is and what matters to them and tailor your story to their interests, values, and level of understanding. For example, if you want to tell donors some stories, like say, okay, there's this project we want to embark on. Or for example, the person that said that she wants to like write stories that are based on STEM, I want to believe that at some point you're going to need funding, you're going to need to you know, elaborate and upscale your, your business. And then it, you have to start thinking from now that, okay, if this is the objective, who are the people that I need to talk to? Or who are the people that, that I need to persuade? And if these are the people that I need to persuade, what kind of story would interest them? For example, I don't know when you tell them, like, okay, you want to create more stories, it's, it is that you, it is because you have found a value in creating STEM stories. And then you are able to articulately express those values to them so that when you are, you are pitching your whatever like to them to maybe fund or invest you are you are clearly articulating to them that okay this is the impact that this project is going to give and this is why i need your support or this is why i need your buying so understand who your audience is uh number two identify key insights now what data is available to you what data do you have you know, you don't start telling stories before you think about data. It's like you look at the data before you start telling your story. And then when you identify that data and you look for what is most mostly relevant. For example, we say that, oh, government expenditure impacts, um, um, what's it called, impacts poverty to a very high level. What do, like, what, what is the insight in that data that government expenditure has a large influence on poverty? What is the insight? The insight is that, okay, Government, if government spends, for example, maybe on uh, uh, on public goods, for example, it gives people enough uh, opportunity. It, now, poverty in the sense that it, it helps level the playground in terms of most people don't need to spend much to be able to access basic uh, amenities. So if you have money, you can provide for your basic amenities, fine. But then there are, there's a particular set of people that are also poor that need to access basic amenities. And if the government does not provide it, they cannot access it. And that widens the poverty poverty gap you know that's like probing your data to say that okay what does this data tell us or you can even flip it and say that okay if the government you know invest in this particular aspect of the economy in human capital development for example education for example it has a ripple effect on human capacity development and human capacity development helps position people in the job market and when you position people in the job market they get jobs and then they earn and then they are able to cater for their own life that's another aspect or dimension to that story so it is you looking at the data and saying that okay this is data that is available how can I prove it? What exactly are the insights? It's meaningful for my story. And of course, craft the narrative. When you have the data, then you have to think about your story app. What, what is the issue? I, I, I like to use a simple method, which is the cause and effect method, which is what is the issue we are trying to solve? Uh, and what is the effect of that issue if actions are not taken? So you structure your story with a clear beginning middle and end. It helps you create a logical flow that's easy to, it's easy to follow. For example, when you start, you introduce the context and the problem or the situation, and then in the middle, you present data to say that, okay, uh, this is the issue and this is the problem. And we're not just saying this is the issue, we're saying it because data also backs it up to say that this is the issue that is going on and then this is what data says about it to make it credible, to say that it is true. And then the end is that, okay, if data has backed it up, then, then we need to do something about the particular issue and then you lay out your call to actions. And then the last one is contextualize your data. So you need to also provide necessary, back, necessary background to you know, uh, help your under, audience understand the data. For example, uh, why is your data important or relevant, for example? Uh, or when you sometimes you know, get stories or perspectives from people, what does it do for your story? What what does it what does it help? Why does it help? So this is what I mean in in practical terms. 
we are stating the data to say that, okay, uh, unemployment rate, for example, is 40% in Nigeria. That is the data you stated, you presented your data. Now, what is the insight? Contextualize that data. That means that, you know, for every, uh, how many people, 40% uh, uh, unemployment, let's say roughly that's maybe 60 million Nigerians are unemployed presently. And then you are saying that, okay, 40% means that 60% of Nigerians are actually able and ready to work, but there's no work for them present. You know, it's different from, oh, there's currently 40% unemployment level, and then you leave it at that. But then you go further to say that, okay, this is what that means, you know, for um for 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 people for people who are able to work but cannot find job. Um, let me say another example that we can use to contextualize data. Let's say, um, okay, there's this data that just came out to say that Gen Z's uh, women are actually able to negotiate more salary, uh, uh, uh more salaries than their millennial counterparts. That's there was a new report by USA. Um, one of the agencies in, in the US. You know, the data said that yes, Gen Z's, oh no. In fact, what the data said was women between the ages of uh, 20 and 25 are able to secure better job opportunities and better salaries than their millennial counterpart. That is data. And I want to put it in context. That means that, yes, we the, the, the rate that we are moving in gender equality or gender pay gap, it is that there's still gender pay gap, but there's hope in that. Currently, we find that the new set of you know, women that are coming into the job market, that's the Gen Zs, they are able to actually negotiate better salaries than their, you know, the ones that, that have or were before them. Now that's you trying to like say that, okay, there might still be the issue of gender inequality, but we are seeing some improvement in this particular area. That's you putting your data within context. And of course, simplify and clarify. We already said it that you should avoid technical jargon and technical language. Explain data insight in simple and clear terms. Research already did the technical jargon. As a comms person, you don't need to go ahead and you know make it very technical for your people. It is that you are able to simplify it and able to communicate in clear terms. This is what happens when this happens, straight to the point. And also, um, Number six, it is incorporate quotes and testimonials from, from experts to add credibility and depth to your story. Like I said, this is also some form of qualitative research that adds more depth to your story, like getting people's perspectives, getting people's opinions, stakeholders, thought leaders, people that you know that their authority in that field that you're trying to break through, and then you get them to also like make comments or say something about the kind of story that you're trying to tell. And of course, con include with actionable insights. Storytelling is not complete if you are not like, if there's no call to action. So what, after telling all the story, after presenting this data, after making it this insightful, what exactly are you hoping to achieve? What exactly do you want to see from stakeholders? And also I want us to look at storytelling from, you know, there's, 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 there's a slippery slope of when you think about storytelling, it's only to the government. No, there are different audience that come, and that was why I said that initially that, you have to understand the people that you're trying to tell the story to. Is it the government? Is it the policymakers? Is it, you know, um, um, what's it called? Is it the communities themselves? Is it donors? Is it partner organizations? So you have to be able to decide who you're telling the stories to. And that is what informs the kind of data that you eventually go for. And of course, understanding your audience, I already said that, but I think I should still reiterate that you must understand before telling a story because it helps you tailor your message. It doesn't just help you tailor your message, it helps you tailor the medium for telling the story. For example, there are some things that you want to spotlight them. If you spotlight it on social media or something, it probably would not make any major impact or any major difference because the people you are trying to talk to, they are not really on that social media that you are aiming for. They are probably in gatherings, in assemblies, or say UNG, for example, or COP, or some of these, you know, uh, uh, strategic meetings that some of some of world leaders they have. And if that is the situation, then you know that this is the kind of story I want to tell, and then this is where this story can get to the people that I'm, you know, I'm targeting. And also, uh, if you don't understand your uh, audience or tailor your story, it may fall flat. It may alienate the readers. It may confuse the readers, and it may miss the mark. For example, one of the things that one of our donors is saying now is that when we present our impact report every year, it is very technical. It is that we give them the numbers, we give them the quotes, we give them the numeric aspect of uh, uh, um, our impact. And they're saying that, I want you guys to tell me what this work that you're doing, how does it impact people? What is the impact on people in developing countries? Seeing that 
most countries, that, most companies that you guys benchmark, their, the, what their impact is on the global south and is on developing companies, uh, uh, economies. So I need to, we need to understand how your work translates to impact for developing economies. And we started to say that, you know, we need to change the model for our impact storytelling. We need to start bringing perspective of people, perspective of communities. And that was what I mentioned during the session that now we are collaborating more with organizations in Africa, in the, in, in the global south to tell more of the story so that we can bring our data to life. So yes, your sometimes it is even okay to ask your audience that, okay, what kind of story, what exactly are you looking to gain? What exactly do you want to hear? And then tailoring your story to that exactly. Um, now, how do you want to tell your story? I said before that if you want to tell your story, um, it's not just documentaries, it's not just videos. You, it, it can be true written stories, like true text, articles, blog posts, reports, books. It can be visual through images such as photographs, infographics, comics, graphic novels. It can be true audio story. It can be true. Uh, podcasts, radio, drama, audio books, poetry, and it can be interactive, such as video games, simulations, or immersive experiences for people. It can be any artistic expressions. So after understanding that, you know, the framework for your storytelling and then identifying your audience, it is that how do you want to tell it? What's most effective? What's most appropriate at that particular point in time? And not just what's most appropriate, the resources that you have, what exactly is the best um, medium that you can go for? And of course, we talk about the metrics, which is that how do we choose relevant metrics? Now, the thing is that one thing about, I'll take say documentaries, for example, it is not just that, oh, yes, we've created a very nice documentary. How do you measure that? The documentary is actually, you know, having the relevant impacts or, you know, it's reaching the relevant audience, for example. So engagement metrics is just basically is telling you that how do you measure, evaluate the impact of your story? How do you measure, uh, sorry, the bathroom is almost done. Um, how do you, it closes in one minute. All right, let me just wrap it up. How do you measure uh, uh, that your story is actually having the relevant impact on the relevant audience? And you know, here I mentioned some, some relevant um, 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 points that can help, which is you have your engagement metrics. Uh, what, what time is spent on reading or watching your article, for example, or the videos that you've created, how many people are watching, how many people have shared, how many people are commenting, and not just how many people are commenting, what is the quality of those likes, what's the quality of those share? And of course, reach how many people are exposed to that particular story. BBC Africa, I, you know, there was one that they did for Sex for Grits and that thing went viral. That's one of the ways that you can, you know, you are able to measure that, okay, what exactly is the reach? And please don't be afraid to say that, or, or to, to, to realize that, okay, this thing is not working, documentary is not working, what, what else can we explore? Uh, written stories are not helping, what else can we explore? Your metrics helps you do that. And of course, behavioral metrics, actions taken, you know, we've had situations where people talk about uh, where there's like a social media outrage, for example, about something, and then the government said, okay, we are taking this action, this action, and this action. And of course, activism metrics, which sometimes you can't measure the reach, you can't measure the engagement, but you can measure the quality of conversations. Are people talking about it yet? Is, that, is, is it creating like a ripple effect where somebody says, that, oh, these people have created this story, and then they take it up, and then another person takes it up, and then they keep taking it up like that until they mainstream the conversation. These are ways that you can you know, used to determine whether your story is effective uh, or it's reaching the target audience or it's having the right uh, uh, effect uh, or not. Um, I'm sorry, I had to like rush through that slide because of um, because of the time, but I hope that you are able to gain something. And um, yeah, and 